Good morning. It's good to have you here at church once again, uh, live uh, on Facebook. Or maybe you might be watching on YouTube later as well. But it's good to have you at our service this morning. Different way uh, than usual. Uh, but it's been this way the last few weeks. And it's still good to be in the Lord's house and to study His Word. Uh, just a couple of announcements here that we have. Um, same old, same old, I guess. Uh, tonight at 5 on Zoom. Here on the church's text line, uh, you'll get a reminder about that. So tonight at 5, we'll be meeting on Zoom. Uh, of course, next Sunday, yet again, here on Facebook at 11. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, being able to meet then as well. You know, as you may know, this past week, uh, Madison County has extended their stay-home order uh, till the end of May. And that does include churches. So unless something drastically changes... Um, I know there's a lot of push going on from different places, so unless something drastically changes, it does not look like we'll be able to have physical church till June. Uh, we will see what else that we can do, and maybe a drive-in service or things of that nature to try to kind of get together a little bit more and uh, be able to see each other some more. Uh, but for now, it looks like this is what we'll be doing for the meantime at least. But uh, we still can worship the Lord, we can still draw closer to him during this hour. John chapter 20 this morning. John chapter 20, and we're going to read verse 24 down to verse 29. And we had Easter last Sunday. Sunday before that, we talked about the crucifixion. So we talked about the crucifixion. And we talked about the resurrection. And now I just want to see a little bit past the resurrection this morning in a story that you have heard of many times, Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. So John chapter 20, verse 24 down to verse 29. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my fingers into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hand. And reach hither, hither thy hand, and thrust in my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we come to you this morning. Thank you for being so good to us, even during this tough time. You are there, Lord, and you have blessed us. I pray for this service this morning. You'll speak to our hearts. Give me the words to say, the clarity of mind to state. We need your spirit now more than ever, Lord. And we just pray that your spirit be upon us in this service. I pray for all those uh, during this time that are struggling, those that are have um, the coronavirus, those that are um, essential workers that are out in the midst of this, and doctors, nurses, truck drivers, everybody that has to deal with the public uh, during this time, grocery workers, other essential workers, store workers, and I pray that you'll just uh, help them, keep them safe, guide and direct our leaders, give them the wisdom that they need, and I pray for that. Our country will come back to you as a result of this crisis. Help us in all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 24, one thing that I notice here, and it kind of goes back to the previous verses as well that we did not read. But we'll read that again. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with the when Jesus came. Now, I'm just kind of inferring something from this verse here. We can miss Jesus when we are not present. We can miss him when we're not where we ought to be. I'm not saying here that Thomas was doing something wrong for not being there. I'm not criticizing him for his absence as he is not criticized in this story for his absence. We have no idea. Maybe he was getting food for the rest of them. He may have taken this so hard that he was not there. This is also the day that Jesus rose from the dead. 
and he may have had previous plans that he had to kind of take care of. Maybe he was important in many ways. We, we don't know. So I am not criticizing him for not being there. But what I'm saying, he still missed out because he was not there. There was a blessing for those present that Thomas did not receive. That's just a matter of fact. And when we miss out on things in life, and I'll give you examples here in a minute of what I'm talking about, we just might miss something that we were supposed to see. Kind of like a new parent. When their kid first walks, they like to be there. When their kid first talks, they like to be there. But it might be that they're not there because they have to work. Because they have something important that they have to do and it just might happen that that kid takes their first words, their first steps, without them there. It doesn't mean that they were doing something wrong, but the fact is that they missed out because they were not there. And there are times that we are going to miss what I'm getting ready to talk about, but hopefully that is few and far between. So what are the things that we might miss out on Jesus if we miss? Number one, it's not the most important, but it's probably the most obvious, is church. <clears throat> when we miss out on church, we miss out, potentially, on Jesus showing up. And Jesus showing up in that building, and him moving like we've never seen him move before, and we missed out because we were not at church. What will we miss when we miss a service? You might say, you know, <clears throat> I, uh, we're not having church right now at service, so I'm not going to watch it on Facebook. Well, what might we miss out that we needed from Jesus during this time if we miss church in the way that we can have it right now? And more importantly than church, some people view this the opposite. They say, if I go to church, well, that's all that I need to do. No, more important than that is our daily relationship with God through Bible reading. And I'll mention in a minute our daily relationship with God in prayer. Even more important in church is what are we going to miss if we don't get in his word today, tomorrow? What might we miss that was in there that was for us for that day? We were going to have a tough day and something was going to come up and we needed that verse. What did we miss? What are we going to miss out on if we missed out on our daily prayer time with God that we needed to pray for, that we needed to ask him for our safety, that we needed to ask him to help us through the day, that he would lead us to the right opportunities. Who are we going to miss out on that we could have led to the Lord because we did not pray to them? What will we miss out on also when we're too busy? This time, this quarantine that many, so many people are under, and we don't have as much that we can do. You see all sorts of people doing things that they could never do before because they had the time. And it kind of shows us, what are we missing out on when we're just too busy? When we don't have time? Do we miss kind of driving down the road and we're in such a hurry we miss the beautiful mountains that God has created that we could stand back at in all of what are we missing out on because we're too busy one thing else thing I noticed out of this verse though and it kind of is told to us in the later verses but I'll mention it here just because we messed up doesn't mean it's all over Thomas was not there. Thomas wished that he was there, but he'd have another chance later, and he was there when Jesus come. God is a God of second chances, and God is a God of mercy, and he will see that he gives Thomas mercy, and he gave him a second chance. And then in verse 25, we see Thomas's doubt. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, 
and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into the side, I will not believe. Thomas was so far gone, it must have put him in such a state when the death of Jesus, all his hope that he had had him was gone. He had lost hope. He was in such despair that he had had these women come and say, Jesus is gone. That was the first sign of the resurrection there. Jesus is not there. Now he had had his disciples say, Jesus himself has been here. And he still did not believe unless he says, unless I can feel Jesus. If we have to feel Jesus, we have a problem. So he, he wants to see the handprints, put my finger into the print of the nails, thrust his hand into the side. He says, I saw what happened to Jesus on the cross, and I know what should be there, and I want to make sure that it's there, then I'll believe. His senses had convinced him that he had seen Jesus die, pierced on the side, wounded hand. He said, brother, him to be raised from the dead is impossible is what he believed. And how many times have we thought that something is impossible? Have we thought that is too far gone? There is no way that could happen. An example of that was when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He said, Lord, it's been four days. You know, you could have healed him four days ago before he died, but now it's too late. And Jesus proved them wrong. Now it's been three days. He said, you know, the, the, you cannot raise yourself from the dead. There's no way you're that powerful. Apparently they did not believe, they truly believe in the power of Jesus. It's not that Thomas did not believe at all, but there's no way that he thought that Jesus could overcome this now. So we might have faith, but what exactly? How much faith do we have? Thomas wanted to feel, not just to see. Thomas didn't want to just to hear. He wanted to make sure he saw and he felt Jesus. Thomas was extreme in his unbelief, in other words. That's why he's been nicknamed Doubting Thomas ever since. It's not that he just didn't believe, but he was extreme in his unbelief. How is our belief? How is our faith? Do we doubt like Thomas? We all do at times. So we need to ask Jesus to give us more faith as the disciples do. They say, Lord, increase our faith. Then I see something encouraging for us. Verse 26, Jesus wants us to have peace. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. So it, what it looks to me like is the first time Jesus appeared to them was on Sunday. Uh, verse 19 said the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, uh, the doors were shut. So that's when Thomas was not there, was on the Sunday, on Easter Sunday, Thomas was not there with the disciples. Jesus appears again eight days later. So today would be the seventh day after Easter. And so he comes on Monday. And so this is looking at it from our perspective. Tomorrow will be the day that Jesus appears to Thomas. That many days after Easter. But Jesus wants us to have peace. It says, he says, if you have a red letter Bible, he said there's one phrase that's read there. It says, peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. Jesus had raised from the dead. He'd done so much, and he comes and wishes them peace. He is where true peace comes from. The only way to peace is through Jesus. The world is looking for peace in all the wrong places. I told her, like I just said, this is after eight days. You, we had Easter last Sunday. This is tomorrow, and Jesus had shown up again to them. 
sometimes Jesus takes time to show up. We have to realize that. We have to realize that we may be praying for peace, we may be praying for anything else, and sometimes it takes time for him to show up. He's on his own schedule. He makes his own time, and we better wait on him. He didn't raise from the dead, you know, till three days later. He didn't raise Lazarus from the dead till four days later. We might think, well, why don't Jesus just come off that cross and raise from the dead right then and there? But he doesn't always work like that. Yes, he could have. He could do whatever he wants to do, but he waited. And we need to be willing to wait. We don't have anything without peace, though. We can have all the stuff in the world without peace that won't mean much. This virus reminds us of that. We can have everything in the world, but there's not a whole lot to do with it right now. You can't go anywhere. You can't go and just buy anything. You try to buy something online and it's a month out. You know, It's hard to do anything right now. All the money in the world doesn't mean anything. And all the money in the world doesn't mean anything if we die. And all the money in the world doesn't mean anything if someone close to us dies. It doesn't mean much. Try enjoying your money while your son is at war. Or your loved one's on their deathbed. We don't have anything without peace. Then I see in verse 27, Jesus knew what Thomas had said. Then says he to Thomas, Reach reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand and thrust into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. I'm not taking this from directly something Jesus said, but what I'm saying is Jesus obviously knew that Thomas had said, I have to reach my finger into his hands, his side, or I won't believe. So Jesus knew that Thomas had said that. Jesus knows everything that we say. Jesus wasn't there when Thomas said that, but he knew it. God is everywhere. And we may not see him physically, but God knows everything that we're doing. He knows what we did last night. He knows what we're doing right this minute. He knows the bad that we may have done last night. He knows the good what we're doing right now being at church. He knows, though, if you don't want to be at church. He knows if you'd rather be somewhere else. He, he, he knows everything and anything good and bad that we do. And Jesus knew exactly what Thomas had said. Jesus knows everything. He knows the past. He knows the present. And he knows the future. He knows the past and he knows the present and the future of you. He knows the past, the present, and the future of your neighbor. He knows the past, the present, and the future of everywhere, everybody, everything that's going on, that ever has going on, that will go on. Jesus knew what Thomas had said. He knows both good and bad that's happened in the press, past, the present, the future, here, there, and everywhere, and everybody, what they're doing, what they have done, and what they will do. It works both ways that he knows the good and the bad. He knows what you did bad in the past, the present, the future, and he knows what you done good in the past, the present, and the future. When we study history, I like to read history books, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot that we never knew. But there's still a lot that you might read not read in that book that happened. There's a lot that you might not read in that book that's in another book. There's a lot that's not told in any book. But Jesus knows it all. No one knows a whole lot of what happened at Custer's last stand. We know what happened with the other soldiers that were not in Custer's direct rank command. And so we have somewhat of a story. We know where they found Custer's men at. I think we know somewhat what the Indians said, but we don't really have we don't have any firsthand accounts from Custer's men because they were all wiped out. But you know what? Jesus knows what happened. If you go to the Outer Banks, you'll have a chance to uh, see the lost colony, Roanoke. 
We don't know what happened there. We've had some stuff we've tried to figure out over time, and maybe we figured some theories out, but we don't know what happened there. God does. We don't know what's going on somewhere else right at this very minute, but God does. Both the good and the bad. He knows what no one else knows. He knows what we do in private. He knows what we do in the dark. One other thing I noticed from this verse, though. We can be merciful and tell the truth. Jesus here is that way. He's merciful. He tells Thomas, put your finger into my hand. Put your hand into my side. He was merciful to Thomas. He didn't say, no, you need to just believe by faith. He was merciful. But he also goes on and says, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. He was merciful, but he also tells the truth. They can coexist. We can tell people the truth about their sins, about what they've done wrong, but be merciful about it at the same time. We can give the gospel and be merciful about it in the way that we tell it. There's a big difference in the way that we say stuff and how people will react to what we tell them. Many times we're tempted to just go off and on a rampage about all the sins that people are doing. But we can be merciful at the same time that we tell the truth. The Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. Then in verse 28 we see Thomas's personal relationship with Jesus. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. To go to heaven, we have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to make sure that he is our Lord and our God. Not our parents' Lord, not our parents' God. Not our neighbor's Lord or our neighbor's God. But our Lord and our God. There is no other way to heaven except to have a personal relationship with him. But not only is our relationship for salvation, but what is our just spiritual relationship with Jesus like right now? Not what it used to be like, not what it's like on Easter Sunday, but what is it like right now? Not what our parents' relationship was with him, but what is our relationship with Jesus? How often are we in the Word? How often are we doing what we need to do? I'd also ask this at this moment in time, especially, how is our nation's relationship with Jesus? We better make sure our relationship matches what it needs to match. That it is the way that it ought to be. Obviously, it's not. We know that. But we better make sure our relationship with Jesus as a nation gets back to where it should be. And then lastly, verse 29, is our faith based on sight. Jesus said of him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. If our faith is based on sight, then it's really not faith. Faith is believing without seeing. As our 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us, we walk by faith, not by sight. If we have to see God, if we have to prove his existence, that's not really faith. There are certain things that, yes, we can look into that apologetics, we call it, defending the faith, that we can say I, it looks to us that God is true. But our faith is not based on those things. It's, fa it's, it's just believing in God. We don't have to have some sort of proof. We just have to have faith. When we sit down on a chair, you're probably sitting down on something watching this. Whatever that you're sitting on, you didn't inspect it all around to make sure it would hold you up. You had faith that it would just hold you up. We're all using gravity right now to keep us on the ground. We're not looking around to try to see where, where the gravity is, exactly everything about it. We just believe that it's there 
and it's going to keep us where we ought to keep us. We don't see God, but we believe that he's there and that he's doing what he is supposed to do. In some ways, I think we're blessed because we haven't seen and have believed. To the disciples, saw and believed. The other people on this earth during these three years that Jesus is ministering, especially, saw what he done and have believed. But this verse says, Blessed are they that have not seen yet have believed. We look at the disciples and the people at that time period and say, How great would it be if we had seen their Jesus when he was on this earth? How great would it be during that time? And they could say as well, How great would it be if we had the experience just to believe by faith? We have some things that they were not able to experience, and we should be thankful for that. God is looking for us to have faith. Seeing is not believing. If you're waiting for God to prove himself, you're barking up the wrong tree. Have faith. Trust that God will see us through. Trust that him in this dark hour. Trust him in every hour. You know, we're going to come out of this. It looks like we're on kind of the downward slope of this virus. Hopefully it doesn't come back. It doesn't come back with a vengeance or anything like that. You know, hopefully we come through this pretty soon. We get to the other side. And we tr when we were praying so hard during this and hoping and all this, but when things get good again and we're on top of the mountain, we don't need to forget God. We don't just pray to God when we're in the valley. Pray to him also when we're on the mountain. Have faith that he will see us through now and that he will see us through then. Trust in God. Have faith in him and he will see us through. We hope to see you tonight on Zoom. It's a great time that we have that we can kind of actually talk to each other and see each other and get in the word again. We'll see you uh, back tonight at 5 on Zoom. If you cannot be on Zoom, uh, we hope to see you back here on Facebook next Sunday at 11. And then it'll also be on YouTube. Thank you and God bless.